So I give the, the place to Lisa, who is going to speak about a very interesting topic. Do we need to pay more attention to bone metastasis? Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me. Um, and I'd like to congratulate all of you to lasting to the bitter end. So, oh, I've gone wrong. Forwards. So we know that approximately 30% of patients who have metastatic renal cancer will have bone metastasis as part of their disease at some point during its history, and that's been shown in a historic series in the Global Expanded Access Program for sunitinib and in a number of randomized trials, uh, remembering that the numbers shown here were numbers at trial entry and so would go up in some of these first-line randomized trials. We also know from a series of investigations spanning a number of years and therefore patients who have a number, will have had a number of different treatments that bone metastases from renal cancer predominantly affect the axial skeleton and we'll all have seen some um, problems related to that. But of course, some of the less common sites of disease and particularly the long bones can be associated with devastating sequelae and we saw a fairly striking example of that in Bernard Scudier's talk yesterday morning. We know that renal cancer bone metastases biologically are osteolytic and also destructive. And so that leads to a number of significant skeletal events, such as requiring radiotherapy, developing fractures, needing orthopedic surgery, spinal cord compression, and developing hypercalcemia. And actually, this series I mentioned at the top from Zekri, that's from the Sheffield group in the UK, from Rob Coleman and Barry Hancock's group, um, described in an era prior to current therapies that 80% of patients would have developed re um, a skeletal event during the course of their bone metastasis with a skeletal morbidity rate, so that is the average number of events per year of between two and a half in the f and four in the first year. So I think that's quite striking, but what is also striking to me that um, more later publications suggest that the number of skeletal events experienced by patients with renal cancer bone metastases actually hasn't gone down that much. Uh, the, the series on the right is a collaborative French and Belgian study from recently, and those patients are st still experiencing a lot of skeletal, skeletal metastases, and so I would suggest that renal cancer bone metastases are a clinically significant problem. We've alluded a couple of times already to the fact that RESIST is a tricky tool in renal carcinoma, and that problem is probably compounded in the assessment of bone disease. These are the imaging tools we currently uh, utilize or have available, plain films, radionuclide bone scans, and cross-sectional imaging with CT, MR, and FGG PET, um, all of which have some sort of problems associated with them. Radionuclide bone scans are probably the most commonly used tool for staging bone metastases, but we know that they ca uh, renal cancer bone metastases can look negative on uh, bone scans, and there's an example here of a patient who had a negative bone scan but was found, having presented with pain, to have a lytic bone metastasis requiring orthopedic surgery. And so recognizing that, this is a summary of the current guidelines for the uh, recommendations for staging bone metastases or bone, bone disease in renal cancer. And there is a consensus that actually radionuclide bone scans are not a particularly good tool. And all of these guidelines recommend that in the absence of specific symptoms or, raised, or altered biochemistry such as a raised alkaline phosphatase, that bone scanning should not be performed routinely. And of course, many of the contributors to these uh, guidelines will have uh, been at this meeting. And I don't think they're saying that it's not valuable to assess bone disease, but simply that the tools available currently um, are, are limited. FDG PET, we know, lacks sensitivity in renal carcinoma, and so is not a solution for this issue. This is a series from our own institution at the Royal Marsden from a couple of years ago, where 47 patients were studied prospectively and all of whom underwent bone scan and whole body MR at the time of staging. And we found in that study that M whole body MR outperformed radionuclear bone scan numerically for specificity, but significantly for sensitivity in diagnosing bone metastases. However, of course, whole body MR is not routinely widely available. And so we are currently looking to replicate this study in something we call the Do More study, looking at extended CT scanning of long, uh, to include the humeri and femora in addition to standard CT scanning of thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. I'll get this in the end. So, do the difficulties of imaging bone metastases matter? And I would suggest that they do matter if we're going to alter the management according to presence of bone metastases.
And so thinking on that point, what happens to patients with bone metastases? And specifically, uh, as one question, do bone metastases actually uh, affect prognosis in any way per se? We heard from Danny Heng earlier today about um, prognostic tools in renal carcinoma, and there are a number of series of courses that have um, retrospectively looked which factors are independent prognostically in multivariate analysis. And I think the summary of this has to be that it's, there is no consensus that bone metastases are independent in such a series. However, if we look at this selection of studies, they've asked a, particular, a different question, which is do uh, patients who have bone metastases as part of their spectrum of metastatic disease perform as well or worse than patients who do not have bone metastases as part of their spectrum of metastatic disease. And these have universally concluded that for overall or progression-free survival, patients with bone metastases do less well. So, of course, that, asks, that begs, therefore, the question, is it the bone metastases per se that lead to a worse prognosis, or is, it this, is this predictive, so saying that the currently available therapies do not manage this disease particularly effectively. Um, from Boyce Link's uh, Belgian-French study, um, they have observed that the presence of bone metastases are associated with higher-grade tumor pathology, a higher mean number of metastatic sites, and a shorter time from diagnosis to systemic therapy, suggesting that maybe there is something about this sort of disease that behaves badly. Now, uh, we know far better now than to suggest that VEGF receptor 2 expression in any way is sufficient for suggesting who might respond to VEGF-targeted therapy, but it is perhaps noteworthy that the levels of VEGF receptor uh, 2 expression in bone are quite low compared with primary and other metastatic sites. So what do we do about this? And let's think about treatment. Of course, there are a number of different possible roles for surgery in the management of uh, renal bone metastases. And I just want to concentrate on the issue of limited or oligometastatic disease. There is evidence that patients who have wide excision with debulking, this is retrospective evidence, I should say, but there is ev retrospective suggestion that patients who have debulking and wide excision, as compared with stabilization alone or no surgery for limited solitary renal cancer bone metastases, um, do better. And therefore, the EAU guidelines now recommend that if metastectomy should be performed where possible. And so I think we should be encouraging our uh, surgeons to do this where, where um, in appropriate patients. Radiotherapy does not confer a survival advantage in metastatic bone metastasis management, but it does improve local control. And it is sometimes said that renal cancer is a radio-resistant disease, but of course, I don't think that is, uh, that's, that's a simplistic view and isn't particularly, and isn't completely true. And there um, are evidence from a number of series that either conventionally planned radiotherapy or stereotactic radiotherapy do provide effective symptom control with pain response um, reported between 60 and 80 percent of patients. And so it clearly is valuable um, for, uh, for those means. How about systemic therapy? So there is in vitro and in vivo evidence of uh, direct effects of sunitinib in bone in terms of reduced osteolysis and bone tumor growth. Um, and we saw this morning, actually, Camilla Porter presented some data from Cesare's group about the difference in response between sunitinib and serafinib um, in, the, um, in bone metastases. But of course, the registration trials with which we're familiar don't report response in bone because bone is not measurable by resist. Um, and so as alluding to response in bone is quite challenging. This is a retrospective uh, analysis from the MD Anderson group um, that was reported at GEOASCU early, earlier this year. And they simply reported on the median overall survival in patients with bone metastases from a historic era without TKIs compared with a, a set, the same size group who had received TKIs. And they showed that the bone metastasis patients did have an improved survival in line with perhaps what we'd see um, in a generalized metastatic renal cancer population. The vicious cycle of bone metastasis was described by Greg Mundy over uh, 10 years ago now, and it's a development or an extension of Stephen Paget's seed and soil hypothesis, but particularly within bone. And this gives us a number of possible targets for the management of bone disease in renal cancer. And so this describes that tumor cells within bone uh, release cytokines and factors such as PTHRP, 
which simulate osteoblasts to produce rank ligand, and the rank ligand in turn uh, simulates osteoclastogenesis. The osteoclasts produce osteolysis, releasing further growth factors such as TGF beta and IGF 1, which in turn uh, promotes further tumor growth. And this has given us a number of targets, a number of agents used to treat bone disease. The most well known, of course, is zoledronic acid, a potent nitrogen containing amino bisphosphonate. Um, Bisphosphonates bind to areas of high mineralized, uh, to mineralized bone at higher areas of, areas of high bone turnover, uh, where they directly inhibit osteo, um, osteolysis by causing osteoclast uh, apoptosis, and they probably also have a number of direct cytotoxic effects within bone. And so this, um, this is a publication by Alan Lipton, which is a subset of a much larger study of 700 patients who had metastatic bone disease from a selection of solid tumors, but excluding breast and prostate cancer. We're fortunate the 74 patient subset with renal carcinoma was published separately. And this showed that those who had zoledronic acid compared with placebo um, had a reduced skeletal related event rate, a reduced time to first bone event, and a reduced mean skeletal morbidity rate. Um, and so, as a consequence of this, zoledronic acid started being quite widely used in the management of metastatic bone disease. More recently, there has been this publication comparing donosumab with zoledronic acid. Now, this is a similar, similarly designed trial in that it is a mixed group of patients with a number of different, from a number of different solid tumors. Um, the total number of patients is just over 700 in each arm, of whom 9% had renal carcinoma. However, we do not currently um, have the renal cancer-specific information from this study. So all we have is the overall information, which is the group who did had neither non-small cell lung cancer or myeloma, but another selection of solid tumors, um, had a better result from denosumab with a prolonged time to first skeletal-related event and in also not just the first event, but a prolonged time to first and subsequent skeletal related events. Denosumab was also found to be superior to zoledronic acid at preventing skeletal related events from other tumors, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, and in a combined analysis of all of these three ran uh, randomized controlled trials. So, after the Lipton publication, zoledronic acid was recommended for patients with bone metastases from renal cancer. But of course, that's a publication from 2004, and so those patients would not have received the, the, the uh, systemic therapy that we use today. So what do we know about the use of bone-directed therapy in the current era, and what are the particular toxicity issues? So there's an awful lot of information on this slide. Um, and I draw attention first to the bottom two publications, which have got huge numbers of patients in. Uh, the Mackay publication, which is a, um, a, a, a collection of patients in a series of randomized controlled trials, um, and Edward Rodoljak's uh, recent uh, poster, which is uh, data from the Global Sunitinib Expanded Access Program. Now, uh, this is retrospective data, and so looking at the outcome with TKI alone, or TKI plus bisphosphonates, is clearly fraught with difficulties, because as clinicians, it's highly likely that we would choose to use bisphosphonates in the patients who we perceive somehow to have worse bone disease. Those large analyses did not show any difference in response rates, which perhaps we shouldn't expect, progression-free or overall survival. There has been a hint from the two smaller series that maybe the group with bone metabolism, uh, with who received bisphosphonates had a slightly better outcome. But of course, we now know about osteochondritis of the jaw, and I think um, having used bisphosphonates quite widely, some people have become more nervous about the widespread use of bisphosphonates um, in combination with TKIs. ONJ related to uh, bisphosphonates was first described in 2003 and therefore was not reported in the early registration bisphosphonate trials. But in uh, smaller, and subsequent, smaller and larger subsequent series, the rates of ONJ have varied between 1% and 20%. We know what some of the risk factors are, and they are a high cumulative dose of high-potency bisphosphonates, so those are the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates, which include zoledronic acid, um, a history of dental disease, invasive dental procedures or dentures, and concomitant anti-cancer therapy is noted as a potential risk factor for increasing this. The rates reported in the randomized controlled trials are shown here. Only the bottom trial, the Azure trial, which is an adjuvant breast cancer study, um, compared, compared zoledronic acid with placebo. And there are a number of rates of, um, of comparison, comparing the rates with uh, denosumab and zoledronic acid. Uh, 
overall, in all of these large randomized controlled trials, the reported rates are somewhere between 1 and 2 or possibly 1 and 5 percent. But actually, that's a huge difference if you're a patient, a 1 in 100 chance and a 1 in 20 or 25 chance of developing um, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Specifically turning to uh, any information we have about the combination of bisphosphonates with anti-VEGF therapy, there are a number of, pub of, of publications, most of them quite small, um, that report rates between 4 and actually as much as 24% possibly. Again, I draw attention to the bottom line, which is the publication from the Global Expanded Access Programme, which is perhaps most pertinent to us, looking at um, 446 patients who received sunitinib with zoledronic acid and reported a rate of 4%. So therefore, what I would say is that we know that the risk of ONJ is reduced significantly by patients having preventative dental measures. So whether the actual true rate is 1% or 4%, we know that if all patients have dental examination prior to starting, that the rate is reduced significantly. And of course, there's, there are very few indications for emergency bisphosphonates, perhaps excluding hypercalcemia. And so therefore, for most patients, there is no excuse not to do this, I would suggest. Um, very, very briefly, the, as we know more about the components of the vicious cycle of bone metastases, further targets have been identified, and I mentioned just two, cathepsin K and SARC kinase, which now have uh, molecules to inhibit them, and they are being investigated in other cancers, but not yet in renal cancer. And so we await to see developments there. And so in conclusion... I would say that bone metastases are clinically significant and may possibly also carry prognostic significance, and therefore that we need treatments to overcome the seeming adverse outcomes associated with these and the undoubted clinical, clinically adverse outcomes. Um, I would favor aggressive management of limited bone metastases, and I suggest that bone-directed therapy does reduce skeletal related morbidity, and actually it probably still does in the era of current therapies, but there are questions of patient selection as ever, and importantly, which patients most benefit, and also the dose and frequency of administration, which, as we will know with bisphosphonates, is very varied. Um, preventative dental programs do reduce osteonecrosis of the jaw, and finally, as we try and improve the outcome um, for bone metastases, we will need improved imaging or other techniques to assess response adequately. Thank you very much.